selfishly, I want more trans and queer stories. So, you know, please give them. Hi, my name is Peter Kanat, and I am here with Elliot Page, uh, actor, producer, and now the author of this incredible new book, Page Boy. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for talking about this wonderful book with me. I just spent the last week devouring it, um, and you just spent the last week or two traveling around talking about it. You know, there's a couple moments in the book where you talk about press tours, specifically Junos, and how they were incredibly challenging because of all the expectations placed on you to be not yourself. Now you are touring with a book that is all about being yourself. This must feel incredible. It does. It feels very, very different. It's funny you say that because, yeah, I have had moments where I've been reflecting on those past times and how I used to feel and alone in the hotel rooms and, and what a difference it is now. Yeah. And I, the book obviously deals with a lot of heavy stuff, but I'm curious, like, if there was something, you know, a moment in it, a, ch a chapter in it that just felt so light and effortless to write, and now you're just sort of excited to share this element of it with the world? Oh, gosh. I mean, yeah, it was nice writing about the, the joyful chapters, like the final chapter of the book. I'm going to a Peaches concert at 16 with my friend Mark, and the excitement and, and, and the joy that I felt in that space, or, you know, wearing a Speedo when I was like eight or nine at a friend's house, you know, just these, these sort of sparks of, of, of bliss, you know, yeah. shining through. I also want to just talk a little bit about um, how much I admire, ever since you sort of initially came out as queer, you've spent so much time thoughtfully choosing projects that deal with queerness. Like I'm thinking of Tales of the City, I love that miniseries so much. Free Held, Vacation, obviously. And I'm curious, now that you sort of reached a new point of yourself, um, how you want to intertwine your identity and your art going forward? like and maybe writing more, or, yeah, just really sort of excited and curious. I mean, it was intense in moments, of course, but I thoroughly enjoyed writing a book. So I hope writing continues to be a big part of my life. Yeah, I mean, just like in the past, selfishly, I want more trans and queer stories. So, you know, <laughs> please give them. And uh, that's something I hope to do with the, the, the platform I have and, and the access to being able to create film television, um, documentary, and, you know, and, and what have you. With the production company I have now, you know, uh, hoping that, you know, we'll, we are and hoping we continue to get to, to tell trans and, and queer and, and stories in general from those who've been underrepresented in, in yeah. the Hollywood landscape. Yeah, and, you know, I feel like in one sense, the sky must feel like the limit. And then on another sense, uh, you really articulated Hollywood's relationship to queerness so well in this book. Uh, I believe the quote is, Hollywood is built on leveraging queerness, and you get into sort of, they take it when it's needed, and then they sort of put it away when they don't need it. Do you think that that is ever really gonna change? Like, what, what, how do you view sort of your fight against that now? I mean, I'd love to be hopeful that it, it will change, you know? I mean, obviously, e things have changed since I first sort of entered that world and sphere to a degree, it's been, not a lot of change, um, but there's definitely been some change. Yeah. I think it won't change until the power structure shift, of course, which are not inclusive and do not reflect our world. The spaces where, you know, people choose what stories to tell, how to tell them, and what to prioritize, of course. Yeah, I certainly have, have hope it will change, and, and I hope we see that at large in all industries as we're seeing, you know, corporations and, you know, some moments offering their support and then when it seems to affect them negatively, yeah, that seems to go away really quick. So I, yeah, yeah. I feel like right now is a huge example of that in so yeah. many horrible ways. Um, yeah, you know, I feel like one of the big ways that Hollywood does leverage queerness is awards. Uh, you you speak about specifically how difficult it was to watch all these straight people winning Oscars for playing you know queer and trans characters, and you were going through everything you were going through at that time. You're also no stranger to awards. Uh, I believe you are one of five Canadians to be nominated for an acting Oscar in this entire century, which is a wild stat. But one thing that's been coming up a lot lately is, you know, all these major award shows, including the Oscars, continue to assume that there are two genders in their acting categories. I feel like it's really time to move forward, and I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on, like, how we do this, just because these institutions are so big. I know, I mean, I, I mean, I agree with you. We have to move <laughs> forward and make these, you know, changes to be more expansive and inclusive and encompassing of, you know, reflecting the variety of people's experiences on this planet. <laughs> uh, 
how we do that, goodness. Uh, I, I feel like I'm not the, no, the, I, I don't know if I have a perfect answer to that other than, um, yeah, expanding beyond our sort of uh, obsession with the binary and, and, and putting everything in these, you know, categories. Yeah, and even just sort of obsession with tradition. Like, there's some people that I know who generally are pretty open-minded people, but they're like, well, we need these two acting categories. We can have to have these two. I'm like, well, right. no, we don't, actually. Yeah. We can change all of it. Yeah, no, we don't. One of my favorite quotes in the book, you say, in our society, anger and masculinity are so intertwined, and that uh, you hope to redefine that in your life. That really spoke to me as, you know, a queer man who cautiously identifies with masculinity and has also like come up against the toxicity throughout my life. I was just curious if you could expand on that and talk about like how you how you want to go about that. Like how you yeah want to redefine that for yourself and for I mean society too. Yeah. I mean I guess I want to redefine it by myself by not getting like influence to uh, uh, adopt or adapt to you know certain behaviors that don't serve me or society on any level, you know, and stepping into myself, the ripple effects that come with self-love have made me, you know, uh, less angry, have made me um, expand more, have made me, I think, show up for people in, in, in better ways. And I feel such positivity coming from loving myself. And I think, trans, cis, straight, queer, what have you, you know, we're all put in, you know, these boxes and with toxic expectations informed by a society that wants to control who we are, who we can be, what we can look like, how we should act, and it doesn't serve anyone. And um, I hope some, that's something that everyone can move past and expand beyond, but, you know, particularly toxic masculinity, which is clearly causes grave harm in our, in our world. Yeah, and that, that journey, which is, you know, obviously very present in the book, I think that's what makes the book so universal and accessible to so many people because we're all sort of on a journey to find ourselves and also a lot of us are up against, in various forms, toxic masculinity. Also, um, you sort of alluded to this already, but, you know, being visibly queer and trans right now seems more dangerous than it has in a long time, which is horrible. And I frankly feel it's kind of unexpected the way it's come up so quickly. But being visibly queer, you know, is also incredibly important. It can save lives. Uh, I've, you know, even in the past six months, I feel like I've experienced more like slurs yelled at me on the street than I had in five, six years before that. Um, and I'm curious because you are one of the most visible <laughs> trans and queer people in the world right now, how you go about navigating that and if you have any insight for those of us who are also trying to navigate that because it's like it's it's tricky i guess right now i feel um fortunate to say that i feel the most embodied and joyful and confident that you know i've ever felt that i could have ever dreamed possible now that does come at a strange time you know and i do feel nervous sometimes. I have had things happen, of course. Right now, I'm just trying to focus on um, being myself and showing up in the ways that I can. And it's actually a really difficult question to answer. I don't have some perfect answer for that because I understand that people feel afraid and are in also far more vulnerable situations than I am. So it's hard to give an answer to it other than Right now, my priority is to be myself and, and, and show up for my community. Well, your like, visibility in general right now is, is saving a lot of lives, so I definitely think that any answer is helpful for people just to hear coming from you. One thing that really struck me was how you start the book with a quote from Beverly Gunn Copeland, and you end it with a story about Peaches, two of the most, the finest queer Canadian artists of all time. What do you? I think it is about the intersection of queerness and Canadianness, only because like the world thinks of us as sort of these meek people. But like I feel like you know I think of Jeremy Butcher, Katie Lang, Rufus Wainwright, you, Beverly Glenn, and Peaches. You're so bold. Like, what do you think about that intersection in terms of why it continues to produce these very specifically and singular queer people? Gosh, 
<laughs> That's <laughs> such a good question. I, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, look, Canada is not some magically better place than the United States, obviously. We have, we have a lot of issues and so far to go in regards to trans and queer rights and, and what have you. And the rhetoric is spreading up very much up here as well. But I don't know if, if perhaps in the ways and in moments there has been a, a little more room for openness and, and self-exploration. I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't even know if that's true. I, I don't think I have an answer for that. I, mean, I just have to be honest. Like, I don't, I don't know if there is an think I have an answer for that. More of an observation of, of yeah. just, I don't know, something I think is kind of magical here for whatever reason, even amidst all the sadness. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay, you ready? Three, two, three.